very pleased to announce Gail Bradley. Thank you. So I want to talk about what next for the climate and nature movements of the global north. And obviously the short answer is, who knows? Uh, but this is what I think at the moment. I'd like to start by celebrating this launch of Professor Jen Bendel's new book, Breaking Together. I think it's going to be an important piece of work for helping to birth a new phase in our movements. <clears throat> I've been so blessed to help birth Extinction Rebellion. The political theorist Hannah Arendt said that power lies in the collective, and when you can feel it, it's beautiful and it's sexy. The alarm has been thoroughly sounded. The public has heard it and wants change. Targets for decarbonizing have been set. And in many ways, of course, not much has really happened. The UK's carbon footprint is actually going up. You can check that out on DEFRA's website. Uh, the destruction of nature is accelerating. Fossil fuel and other corporate interests are push pushing back in a new wave of tactics. You know, it's called discourses of delay. We're in a meta-crisis, we all know that, that's why we're here, and Professor Bendel shows we've already entered a state of collapse. You know, there's crises in mental health, in, in the climate nature, in inequality, a media system that spreads polarities and fake news, looming crises in our food and financial systems, and also the new threats that are emerging now, or next couple of years from artificial intelligence. Do ask me a question about that if you want. Um, the extraction, an exploitation of globalized neoliberalism and neocolonialism has really come home. It now includes social murder within the UK. Last year, there were 40,000 excess deaths. That's deaths that weren't expected over the five-year average. So to solve any problem, you have to really understand the nature of the problem. You have to really understand the root causes and I, I am, I have to say, struck at times by a seeming lack of curiosity within our movements about this. There appears to be a desire to keep it simple. Uh, we need to wake people up to pressure the governments for change. I don't believe that will work. And I have to say, as a founder of uh, co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, I don't think any of our fellow co-founders thought that either. It was a campaign with simple messaging in it to get things moving. Um, I don't believe it will work because I don't believe it's founded in addressing the complexity of the predicament that we're in. So here's a foundational question from my point of view. Why would a species participate in the destruction of the life support systems that it relies on for its well-being? To understand this complex situation, we need to understand the nature of our species, Homo sapiens. We have been a highly flexible species, adapting to our environment and creating cultures to support our flourishing. We've learned from our mistakes. We've lived in many different ways, including systems of self-governance. We have found ways to be with and in life that makes life more beautiful, more abundant. We have done our job well in the past as what's called a hyper-keystone species and an ecosystem engineer. I won't get into explaining those. They're in Jen's book, book actually. Um, but they're, they're species that impact uh, significantly the environment that they're in, positively. <laughs> we are also a species that believes the stories we tell ourselves. And we're living in a story. It's really what you call a doxo. It so, has been so common sense that we're not to even think about it. Um, and it's a story that says we always need more, and this is going to be achieved by something called progress. The story says that we live in an inanimate machine world, and that human beings are fundamentally selfish, and so we can't be trusted to act well. The story says we need the power of financial markets to control us, the idea being that they'll create some optimal conditions once they've been fully unleashed. And I think there's a shadow in environmentalism that agrees with part of this story that says humans are the problem, nature would be better off without us. That kind of self-hatred isn't going to help us. As DNA Nation grandmother Pat McKay points out, 
Humanity has got low self-esteem right now. We think that everything we touch we destroy, but it's not so. It's because we've agreed upon and we're acting within a certain paradigm. It's a paradigm of control and domination dressed up in modernity's story of civilization and progress. Consumerism, colonialism, racism, climate and ecological tipping points, and a political economy of rapacious extraction, lacking functional democratic oversight, are all symptoms of this dominant domination paradigm. So how did we get here? As psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, and also the work of Jill Balty taylor that got mentioned earlier, has articulated, based on reviews of thousands of scientific papers, human beings, like other animals, have two very distinct hemispheres in our brain, on the left and the right-hand sides, and they have very distinct roles. We might like to think of our left as our onboard computer. It's very skilled in abstraction, checks data, it makes guesses, and it represents reality to us. We're not in reality when we're in the left hemisphere, it's representing it to us. Um, especially when we have to make rapid choices and we feel under threat. So is that thing that's rustling in the bush? Is it potential food? Is it coming to eat us? Or is it one of our children? What we do really matters. The left hemisphere tries to keep us safe and well. And in its rightful place, it's in service to our right hemisphere, which is able to reside in the flow and presence of life. The right hemisphere is in a constant process of relating, influencing, and being in life, and being influenced. It's in life as a presence. So experiencing the aliveness of life, that's what the right hemisphere is about. There's peace in the right hemisphere. There's the urge to collaborate. There's a sense of vision. It's where humour comes from, playfulness and empathy. With connection to the wisdom of our hearts, our guts, our minds and bodies as one. Ian's work is very much on the hemispheres. This is focused, but of course it's, it's the whole body. It's been said that the left hemisphere is more rational. It's not so. It makes profound mistakes that have significant impacts especially when we're subject to historic trauma and ongoing unmanageable levels of stress. This is when the left hemisphere pathologizes. It can be angry, the left hemisphere. And it has the uh, urge when stressed to control, to dominate, to withdraw, to fight. It wants certainty, simplicity, and comfort. It's the voice in our head that judges us and others and tells me to eat chocolate. It wants to grasp at things. It's susceptible to addiction. It can tend towards narcissism and forms of denial. It will hang on to whichever story supports its need for control and comfort, whether that flies in the face of evidence or empathy. Sound familiar, eh? So the current polycrisis and creeping collapse that humanity is now in is at least 5,000 years in the making is postulated to have, have resulted from collective traumatic experiences in certain parts of the world associated act actually with climatic events. We have a growing understanding of what people do when they're under stress. The autonomic nervous system kicks in. You choose from fight, flight, fawn or freeze. And when stress is severe and prolonged, a form of shutdown occurs. We enter a state of separation from innate parts of ourselves from each other and from our environment. A pathology that seeks comfort, certainty and control kicks in. In other words, the left hemisphere takes over. No bad thing for the short term, but a disaster when it takes over the driving seat and builds modernity in its image. So this is all a fancy science-based way of saying we're in a spiritual crisis. A few thousand years ago, communities under stress started to dominate and control the land and people, especially women and children. Extraction and theft create surplus, and that surplus can be used to shore up power and that power to get more power. It's uh, in systems theory, it's called the success to success mechanism. It's a fancy way of saying those that have can get more. But of course, you're in a non-life neurological state. So in that way, domination becomes baked in and everybody gets fucked over one way or another in the process. 
Our collective trauma expresses itself in many ways, including scarcity thinking, shame, inferiority and or superiority complexes and defaults are organising to what George Lakoff called the strict father value system, which is focused on reward and punishment to get you to behave. You've got your strict father in your own head, right? Having words. It wants, and the wants and pathologies of the left hemisphere have been baked into our systems of governance, economies, culture, media, and education. The pathology has been given a name many years ago. It's called Wetiko by indigenous Algonquin speaking people from Abiyala from America. Wetiko is this cannibalistic spirit that can take over people's minds, leading to selfishness, insatiable greed, and consumption as end in itself. Wetiko has many other names because it's recognized by humanity across the world. So in Buddhism, it's the hungry ghost, it's the Rakshasas. In Hinduism, in African traditions, it's Shirugu. And I think the way we talk about in our culture, we've got zombies and vampires. The elites are the vampires, and guess what? We get to be the zombies, you know, a lot of the time. That's shut down state, right? Um, it systematizes as many sub-pathologies. For example, white supremacy. And in fact, the First Nation peoples have referred to Wetiko as white man's disease. Uh, with awareness of this tendency of humanity, healthy human cultures take care of it. Now, actually, what, I think in Egyptian uh, cultures, there was a headdress. Um, and what it represented it was a snake down the middle that represented the balance of the hemispheres. It's baked into stories, the master and the emissary story, the stories of the two brothers. And what the Haudenosaunee talk about is a need to, collect, to, to cultivate the collective good mind. You have to have practices baked into your culture. And what happens in our diseased culture is they get baked out. So given that we live in, in my estimation and others, within a pathologized system of systems, we need to understand more about how systems work. They may be created by human interventions and they involve simple rules, like such as interest-bearing debt, I absolutely agree with Jen. That's a super important piece that we need to focus on. But at a certain level of complexity, they can't be controlled anymore. They take over, and, and the system takes over, and new properties emerge. They contain thresholds or tipping points, where, and they absorb some changes, but at some point, they flip into a new uh, state or collapse. And they contain positive reinforcing mechanisms in them and negative controlling feedback loops. And so this has been looked in detail, for example, by the academic Jennifer Hinton, who's shown that there are three vicious cycles, feedback loops, within the for-profit economy, which reinforce inequality, consumerism, and political capture, uh, leading to the destruction of the biosphere and paving the way for increasing authoritarianism. And then just a bit more bad news, and we'll move on. <laughs> on top of this, the left hemisphere has got inbuilt defence mechanisms to protect us from psychological pain. Is how cognitive dissonance works and willful blindness, which is known as the ostrich effect. And these are just fancy ways of talking about deceit and denial. So green growth is not possible, but the system is lying to itself about it now. Um, it uses fancy uh, maths called integrated assessment models. They're based on the uh, economics of um, a neoliberal called Nordhaus, who's been thoroughly debunked, but they're still in the Bank of England's calculations, right? Uh, the insurance and pensions industries are other clear places the system just lie into itself. So making demands of governments and corporations, it can be a communication tool. We're saying, this is what's morally and rationally correct to do. But here's the thing. Let us not carry on reinforcing the belief that business as usual will do what's needed. Let's name it. They can't and they won't do the right thing. Let's just get over ourselves with that. And within that, let's be clearly anti-authoritarian and clearly take a stance against the economics of accumulation and growth for its own sake. So I do ask why our social movements think that continually raising of alarms and getting on the streets to demand change is going to be enough, especially as it includes triggering ourselves into pain and fear bodies. Do we also think we can continue to ignore the barriers to our deeper collaborations, the playing out of divide and rule tactics? So then the question is, what then in the face of this for our social movements in the so-called Western democracies? 
What I think we need are social movements based on the politics that are very mindful of the wet eco-pathology, uh, systems and collapse. Ones that see the anti-life systems of destruction and both forcefully and mindfully separate from them. That's what the anti-life system's doing. I see it, see it in me, but I'm choosing something else. Each one of us have that choice in the moment and as groups and ongoing. And we know well that change is led by vision. I think it's time to unite within a collective collaborative framework for change, which would also leave space for many ways of doing things, seeing things that are location and culture specific. However, another pathology of the left hemisphere is to lack vision. That's the, it's the job of the right. From its place of pain, in, feels of, in feelings of scarcity, separation, soullessness and powerlessness, can't vision. And presumably that's the root of the statement that people can envisage the end of this world more than the end of capitalism. Let's not be troubled by this. There are visionary people, ideas and cultures that we can root into and be nourished by, both current and historic. Let us be fed by our stories of resistance and collaboration. For example, the land justice and the abolitionist movements. Let us spend time learning about our histories. And hey, this left hemisphere business is something we can choose, literally in the moment. We now have a greater understanding of somatic practices, of the va va ventral vagal system, to use fancy words. There's breath practices, dance practices, sex and medicine practices that help us to recover our nervous system. So you can uh, learn about the best ones for yourself and the groups that you work within. What helps you to be in life? You know, What are the restorative practices that work for you and your group? Because that is the foundation of whiteness, is not to be in life. It's been done to us, and we get to move on from that and re-choose to connect with life. It's, it's, the one, it's one of the important ways we can pay attention to the system within us and do something about it. And we can also pay attention to the manifestation of the system amongst us and do something about that too. And there's growing understanding of ways to support and practice collaboration. These are the sorts of things that get skipped over in movements in, you know, support, in, in, in sacrifice to the let's get shit done and we feel like we're doing something because we're on the streets. I'm not saying let's not do that. I'm just saying this is more important, actually, because it's how we do it. Uh, and I want to say that many of these specific points I'm making have been strongly advocated for by visionary leaders of colours and outside of, outside of cultures within Extinction Rebellion. Um, and what I've, so I've learned from them. And what I notice in our Global North movements is the lip service we pay to these leaders, if we even listen, and, and to other struggles and cultures. And I am and have been guilty of that. And it's not something to feel shame about or to stay in a sort of dissociative, avoiding state around. Some of us call that the white glaze. It's just something to, it's, it's to understand that it's a system. It's not our choice. You know, it's, been, it's been done to us, but to notice it. And we can proactively tackle that through practices and processes. And most importantly, through genuinely linking our struggles practically and uniting with our global family. There's a similar story regarding our young ones in a disease culture that's forgotten the necessity of healthy eldership. We haven't received eldership ourselves, most of us. And so how do we know how to be an elder? We have to relearn that uh, way of being. And, and so, there, of course, there are gaps, and it takes time and effort on both sides to build bridges. If we continue to centre ourselves as minority world, largely racialised as white activists, in the story, I believe that we, we are going to fail. We're being called back into relationship to undertake repair and resistance together. Another word for resistance is protection. We protect what we love, and we love those that we're in relationship with. So I've talked a fair amount about systems. And what I am alluding to here is that we are part of a more enduring system than that of capitalist, colonialist modernity. We are, of course, part of the systems of life. This is our birthright. 
Let us root ourselves into aliveness, reclaiming our role as keystone species and serving life's purpose, which includes composting and adding to the complexity and beauty of life. We can intend to create the conditions for life to thrive by learning from life. And there's a container of love and of spirit that we're being called to co-create. I often say, when I look at you know, activist friends of mine that are working very hard to build machines to defeat a machine, we, this is a 5,000-year-old machine. We won't defeat it by building the machine. We defeat it. We, we help it to have a good death because it is dying, and we do have this choice. We help it to have a good death by feeling and finding this container together that's the spirit of life. And what a beautiful invitation. Who wouldn't want to be alive now with that invitation and that choice to make? So life thrives because it collaborates and because it learns. And through purpose, collaboration and learning, what happens in life is that unexpected things emerge. So we can work on the conditions and see what emerges. I also think that we can help to see things to emerge. And let's then... Um, you know, work across different organizations and networks, seeing our shared concerns and these root causes, and then, and then develop some kind of framework together around how, how we see the change, how we see the change. So I'm just giving you an example, because of course it's never one person's to write alone, but I do feel it's time to start naming the vision that we have going forwards. We acknowledge that we're stronger together, bringing our many ways of being, seeing, and doing in unified people's power. We will coordinate the stopping of harm, acting as a multifaceted immune response, a global immune response, which will shut down crime scenes and attack the flow of resources to them. And yes, that does include sabotage, which is best done below the ground, in my view. We assert the need for repair of the harm that has been done. We will found our economies on justice, need, and sufficiency, with degrowth economics for global north countries, which have founded in visionary concepts like universal basic services, and growth within sufficiency, sustainable limits in countries below optimal per capita income levels at the moment. We will not be paying unjust debts, bills, and rents. We repudiate debts and other extortionate bills. I'm, I'm told that, you know, for everything you, that you buy, that at least 50% of it is paying interest somewhere down the line. We'll build collective solidarity. Here's where that collaboration's needed. Here's where that routing's needed. And it has happened. Mortgage people, you know, they come after you because you can't pay your mortgage in other countries in Spain. A whole political party grew up around that. They said, no, you're not having this person's house back. That's the kind of solidarity we, can, we need to build, right? And we had a, some sort of practice with COVID, I guess. So we need safety nets of support so that we can collectively unhook ourselves from this odious extraction from our bodies and from the land and from our wider global family. And as I said earlier in the question, I think we need to really see debt as power. You know, it's actually a handful of people own the world's wealth. Why are we paying them? Uh, what is, what is possible? Of course, they, what happens is you get a crap credit rating. Mine's shocking because I've played around with this three times. No, I had no real problem with it, to be honest, but I don't need a credit rating. But what can happen when Global South countries come together and unify? And don't forget, our political system is designed to stop that from happening. Global South leaders who go there, the Kwame Nkrumahs of the world, etc., they get murdered by our politicians, not directly, but by our systems, right? So supporting the sort of modern-day versions of pan-Africanism and, and deep solidarity from community to community, where we're saying, we're not paying our debts here, Pakistan, and ridiculous that you, anybody would say you need to pay a debt, right? Uh, just to be slightly technical about this, Jason Hickel talks about it. It's the way to decolonize. Uh, modern monetary theory looks at how these countries can create their own money, but you have to have more than one country working together. You need that solidarity. So there's a root here. And actually, the reality is that countries won't be able to afford debts. We won't be able to afford all these bills and mortgages. So we may as well get on with it sooner. <laughs> we assert that the land under our feet is ours to steward, that it is a common treasury for all. The ownership of excessive tracts of land is unjust and against life. 
We will reclaim and occupy the lands of our birth, grow in food and live in lightly. We're forming economic bodies for cooperating and commoning, shaping the way we work together and meet our collective needs. We are upholding and creating structures for people-led governance and law. Our assemblies and our tri tribunals and other bodies to assert the people's rule of law. We do not recognise the governments and the legal structures that destroy life on earth as ours. It's not our government. <laughs> you know, it's an oligarch in power. It's not, it's, it's not my government, right? Uh, we're leaving them behind. We're creating and protecting community, educational and media forms that are, being, that are led by our communities for the benefit of the well-being of the community. And of course, a good, look, a good thing about all this is that movement's doing all this stuff already, right? Like there's a really strong and, and building land justice movement in this country. We, 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 you don't have to do all this stuff. Like, what's yours to do in it? We found our health on the aloe mothering of our young and the well-being of our land, air and water. We find and protect our ways of collective, sorry, we find and protect our ways of cultivating our collective good mind. We remember the medicines of the land and ways to be well through connection. We're growing food locally and tending the well-being of our water. We're building locally and local owned energy and transport infrastructure and reducing our demands. We're working towards a just peace, refusing to participate in unjust conflicts and locally linking, I'll explain that word in a second, locally linking our struggles for peace. So in all of this, as Jem's pointed out, what we're really doing is asserting our right to be truly free. And people who are systems experts look at this system, Schmachtenberger being an example, they say, there's one uh, wet direction it's going in towards collapse. There's another in the direction of eco-authoritarian, fascistic, geoengineering, globalist, etc. surveillance, capitalism. What's the third attractor? And I'm saying the third attractor is something that we co-create, this container of vision and love and togetherness, wisdom, agency, and taking charge of our neurophysiology so we can be in life, you know. So... There's be specific things then to focus on in our communities, democracy and leadership, you know, mapping who's doing what in a community, organising collapse aware leadership meetings to explore collaboration and develop ways to meet heightened times of crisis. We've got to catch each other. Organising talks and people's assemblies on collapse. So uh, Glastonbury's ahead of the game. Thank you, Indra and others. Uh, and on specific relevant local issues. To do this... We need mental well-being. So I'm so glad that today is being used to support uh, the mental health processes locally. We need co-liberation and collaborative practices. By co-liberation, I'm talking about pathways for addressing the issues of power and privilege as they show up in us. And we need to find ways of supporting villages of mental wellness. That book I've mentioned twice already, Hospice in Modernity, she thinks the collapse will come. It'll be mostly shown by our mental health breakdowns. You know, that's what we're in. So how do we take care of each other in that? How do we be a village? You know, if one of your friends is in a crisis and, and you're like, fuck, you know, I've already got enough on my plate. You, we can't do this one-to-one. -one. We need more flow. It needs more of us to be in groups together. Uh, I just want to send love and blessings to the male bodies here and that basis, actually, because the way the patriarchy in particular smashes and separates our men is so abusive and uh yeah th th that need for men to reconnect in their ways is central here as well we need to get rebellion ready into local resistance and direct action i talk about history of talk about the history of local and wider resistance to inspire actions on specific local issues that might benefit from civil disobedience approaches i think we can always focus on the banks to tell the story of economics and debt-based finance systems and what they're also funding. Here's one. Here's a challenge for you, uh, Indra, actually. I really think it's time to do collective non-payment of council tax. Uh, and I think certain councillors might back that uh, if the money was then pulled together and a people's assembly decided how it was being spent. Maybe the mental health services need even more money. You know, maybe... Uh, 
we want to do some insulation of some properties or buy, a, buy something out, put it towards a common in project, etc. We've got to build our muscle of debt refusal. Also, potential water bill payment strikes. You know, why are we paying these people? Come on, it's a joke, isn't it? And you can do this by conditional commitment, which just means I'll do it if 50 people join me. You don't, you don't have to just start it on your own. Uh, we can join local positive direct actions, you know, the, the folks that are taking care of our water, our food, community safety, and so on. I really love the work of Mary Reynolds. Do you know that work, We Are the Ark? I've been told off by the Daily Mail. I ought to be really ashamed for my messy garden. I actually had a sign up, we, this is an ark, you know, acts of restorative kindness. We can give our gardens, at least in part, back to nature, grow food. And I, I think there's something about the agency of that that's, that's important and shouldn't be skipped over in, in, the, in the ways our movements want to be sort of, oh, you know, we did this amazing action, it went viral. Yeah, that, you know, it helps get the message. The simple act of letting your garden wild and the hedgehogs coming back was one of the most joyful things in my last few years, the baby hedgehogs, weren't they? Gorgeous. Um, so this local linking. So... We, our communities need to link to our family across the world. We probably want to do some work on this whiteness thing that's come up a lot today, and I really hope nobody feels any shame in around that. It's not where this is coming from. It's about moving through the system in us. And um, we're working in XRB in the change with our International Solidarity Network and creating uh, ways to do this linking. There are global South communities of resistance that have been around for centuries that we can learn so much from. And we want to be mindful of the way that resistance gets NGOized, you know, turned into something that's a bit of a sort of spectacle. And that's going to require proper dialogue and practices that prepare the ground. We want to be supporting our local trade unions and strikes. So there's lots and lots of practical things. That's just my take at the minute. And these practical ways to face life and face the collapse together. This is one way of how we might break together. So I want to end by offering a prayer of dedication because this is a time where the magic source, the spirit, is the thing that the other, the system doesn't have. Yeah. Uh, we dedicate our lives to hospicing the systems of destruction, including within ourselves to resisting harm, to protecting and building islands of sanity, sanctuary and sanctity. We ask for our arrogance based in separation and fear to be released. We ask that we can figure ourselves and each other. May we remember who we are, feel where we belong and see with new eyes. May we trust in the mystery, in aliveness, and in love. Thank you. Thank you.